Hey everybody, welcome back. Long time no see, my name is Quick, and I am here to help you crush the endocrine questions on your step 1 exam. As per usual, we will start the video by very briefly going over our method of tackling questions, and then I will move towards predominantly providing explanations while letting you guys do all of the heavy lifting as we progress through the video. For those of you who are already familiar with the method and want to just jump straight into trying out questions and going through the explanations, feel free to skip to the timestamp listed on your screen now. For those of you who are new or just want a refresher on how to approach questions, let's just briefly go over the method. So what is it? Well, since the USMLE step and complex exams are very long tests, we focus on optimizing your time and your effort. We do this through a structured approach that I will put up on your screen now. The first step in tackling the question is to read the last one or two lines of the question stem. If there is a picture or audio, we recommend to also look or listen. Then we go on to read the question itself now, that isn't to say we read the full question in its entirety, but rather just the sentence that has the actual question mark at the end of it. All of those steps will have provided us with a general understanding of what topic this question is covering, as well as what the question is actually asking. We then go on to read the entire question stem looking for keywords that may help us answer the question. Approaching questions in this manner will make you faster and more efficient come test day. And don't worry if the steps don't make much sense to you yet, we will pull up the first question and I'll go over each step with you. So here's question one. Let's start with step one of our method where we read the last one or two lines of the question stem. On physical exam, the patient appears restless and anxious, the thyroid is unable to be palpated on exam, and EKG is within normal limits. Now let's read the question itself and the answer choices. What is the most likely additional finding in this patient? A. Increased urine metanephrines and vanilla mandelic acid. B. Positive urine amphetamine metabolites. C. Increased total T4 levels. D, decreased serum thyroxine binding globulin, or E, increased free T4 levels. So without reading the entire question, we have gathered that this question is trying to get an, an associated finding in a patient who appears restless and anxious, but does not have an enlarged thyroid or EKG changes. Now that we have an idea of what we are looking for, let's go through the entire question and try to highlight some keywords that will help us answer this. A 35-year-old female, G1P0, at 23 weeks gestation, presents complaining of anxiety for the past month. She additionally endorses insomnia for the same duration. The patient works as a corporate lawyer at a major investment firm and reports increased stress recently to meet strict deadlines. Past medical history includes generalized anxiety disorder and depression for which she takes sertraline. The patient denies current alcohol or illicit drug use, but admits to previously taking modafinil to help her stay awake when her job requires her to work overnight. The patient denies current alcohol or illicit drug use, but admits to previously taking modafinil to help her stay awake when her job requires her to work overnight. Vital signs are temperature 98.9 .9 degrees Fahrenheit, blood pressure of 120 over 62, heart rate of 82 per minute, respiratory rate of 20 per minute, and BMI is 23.6. On physical exam, the patient appears restless and anxious, the thyroid is unable to be palpated on exam, and EKG is within normal limits. So the key words that we highlighted were 35-year-old female, G1P0, at 23 weeks gestation, anxiety for the past month, insomnia, increased stress, generalized anxiety disorder and depression, sertraline, denies current alcohol or illicit drug use, and vital signs are within normal limits, restless and anxious, thyroid is unable to be palpated, and EKG is normal. So to sum up the general clinical presentation, we have a pregnant woman who has a history of generalized anxiety and depression, who admits to increased stress due to her job and endorses insomnia and anxiety for the past month. Her vitals, physical exam, and EKG are all completely normal. Now what I want you to do is pick an answer that best answers this question and we'll go over each choice. Alright, so what do we think about choice A, increased urine metanephrines and vanilla mandelic acid? With what condition does that correlate? Hopefully you are saying pheochromocytoma, which presents as episodic hypertension, tachycardia, and headache due to overproduction of norepinephrine and epinephrine. Does this woman have those symptoms? Yeah, hopefully you're saying no, right? So we can eliminate answer choice A. How about choice B, positive urine amphetamine metabolites? In real life, it is possible that this woman can be lying, but the NBME will not try to trick you like this. So a general rule of thumb for test taking is that take whatever a patient says as true. This would actually eliminate this answer choice as she does explicitly deny alcohol or illicit drug use. How about choice C, increased total T4 levels? 
Well, we know that this patient is pregnant, and what happens to the thyroid hormones during pregnancy? Well, during pregnancy, there is an increase in total thyroxine binding globulin, which binds up free T4. This leads to a transient decrease in free T4, which stimulates the hypothalamus to produce more TRH, which in turn makes the pituitary produce more TSH, which will then increase the free T4 levels back to normal. Remember, the general gist of a negative feedback mechanism like this is to always attempt to return to normal. However, since there is more thyroxine binding globulin, there may be normal free T4 levels, but the total T4 levels are increased since there is more T4 that is bound to the increased levels of thyroxine binding globulin in the serum. So choice C is the correct answer in this case. But just for completeness sake, let's go over choices D and E. So choices D and E were ruled out with the previously mentioned reasoning since we know in pregnancy you have increased thyroxine binding globulin and low to normal levels of free T4 depending on the timing. The hardest part about this question is that you may have thought she was demonstrating signs of hyperthyroidism because she was anxious and had insomnia. However, her vital signs were normal and the thyroid was not enlarged. It is much more likely that this patient is having an exacerbation of anxiety due to her stressful job. Okay, so now that we've finished question one, what I would like for you to do for the remaining questions is just pause before I start reading them and try to practice doing the method on your own. Uh, for the remaining questions, I will just be reading them in full and going over how to arrive at the correct answer. All right, so question two. An 89-year-old male presents to the emergency room by ambulance after the patient's neighbor found him unconscious on this floor for an unknown duration. Past medical history includes hypertension, hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes mellitus, depression, and insomnia. Medications include captopril, furosemide, metformin, and mirtazapine. Vital signs are 99.2 degrees Fahrenheit, blood pressure is 104 over 58, heart rate is 104, respiratory rate is 20 per minute, and oxygen saturation is 95%. On physical examination, the patient is obtunded and difficult to arouse. Mucous membranes are dry, rapid finger stick reveals a glucose of 880 milligrams per deciliter. Which lab finding is most consistent with this patient's pathology? A, increased serum ketones, B, serum osmolality greater than 320 milliosmoles per kilogram, C, elevated anion gap, D, decreased serum pH, or E, decreased PaCO2. So like we did with the first question, let's summarize this patient's clinical presentation. We have an elderly male with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, type 2 DM, depression, and insomnia who's found unconscious. He's on medications for his conditions, he shows signs of dehydration, and he has a high serum glucose level. So take a few seconds to select your answer, and then we'll discuss the choices. Hopefully you chose an answer. Let's start with choice A, increased serum ketones. This is most often associated with what? Hopefully you're saying diabetic ketoacidosis. This question was generous in telling us that this man has a past medical history of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Do we typically see DKA in a patient with type 2 DM? You should be saying no, as type 2 DM has a resistance to insulin, but they're still making it endogenously, which is still able to inhibit ketogenesis, so you don't get the ketone formation. There is a particular exception to this, namely insulin-dependent type 2 diabetes, but step 1 just wants you to differentiate between type 1 and type 2 in the general sense. In general, type 1 diabetes mellitus is associated with a younger population diabetic ketoacidosis, an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis, a sweet or fruity odor on the breath, and elevated serum glucose levels, though not as high as patients with what we're going to talk about after, which is hyperosmotic hyperglycemic syndrome. So type 1 is an autoimmune-mediated destruction of beta cells in the pancreas. This is different than type 2. Type 2 DM is associated with middle-aged to older populations that have a decreased sensitivity or an increased resistance to insulin. It is associated with a very elevated serum glucose level, usually well above 600. It's associated with hyperosmolality and an absence of acidosis. Okay, how about answer choice B, serum osmolality greater than 320. Hopefully you're saying that that is the correct answer as this patient is a type 2 diabetic with a very elevated glucose level indicative of hyperosmotic hyperglycemic syndrome. Another way you could have approached this question is to just have realized that all the answer choices have to do with differentiating between type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus. 
So you want to find the one that only fits into one category. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. A 57-year-old male presents to your office for routine evaluation. Over the past four months, he has noticed increased fatigue, and throughout the day, he has episodes of nausea, vomiting, and dizziness. His symptoms are most severe after eating meals and improves within a couple of hours. His medical history includes hypertension, hyperlipidemia, generalized anxiety disorder, and diabetes mellitus. Current medications include lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide, metformin, sertraline, and lispro. Vital signs show a temperature of 99.1 degrees Fahrenheit, blood pressure of 138 over 70, heart rate of 74 beats per minute, respiratory rate of 16 breaths per minute, and BMI of 33. On physical exam, there is diminished sensation to pinprick on the bilateral dorsal feet. Achilles reflexes are 1 plus bilaterally. Lab studies show a serum sodium concentration of 136, potassium of 3.6, chloride of 103, blood urea nitrogen of 34, and glucose of 190. The hemoglobin A1c is 9%. Which of the following is the mechanism of action of the first line therapy for this patient? A. Metoclopramide, B. Ondansetron, C. Clarithromycin, D. Loperamide, or E. A prepotent. So take a quick minute to think of what this clinical presentation is and choose your answer. Okay, hopefully you've all selected an answer choice. Let's go through the clinical presentation for this patient. We have a middle-aged male who has an ongoing history of fatigue with nausea, vomiting, and dizziness that is exacerbated with eating. He has a past medical history remarkable for diabetes that is currently being treated with medication and has signs of neuropathy via diminished sensation to pinprick of his feet with decreased Achilles reflexes bilaterally. His hemoglobin A1c and serum glucose are both elevated. Hopefully when you're going through the answer choices, you realize that a majority of them are anti-emetic medications. So we should be thinking about what nausea-related condition is associated with uncontrolled diabetes and which anti-emetic is the optimal choice for this patient. Whenever you see nausea and vomiting with eating in a poorly optimized diabetic patient, you should be thinking about diabetic gastroparesis, which is essentially just poor upper GI motility, specifically localized to the esophagus, and it's due to neuropathy. The optimal medication for this is answer choice A, metoclopramide. Now, some things to note about these answer choices. For metoclopramide in particular, it is one of those medications that block dopamine D2 receptors. In so doing, you could actually develop extra pyramidal symptoms or look like a Parkinsonian patient. All right, so if you see a patient who is diabetic and just start taking a new medication for nausea and vomiting after meals, and they start developing uh, cogwheel rigidity, shuffling gait, and a tremor, right? They also call it a pill rolling tremor. You would probably choose metoclopramide as the culprit for those symptoms. For most other causes of gastrointestinal related nausea or chemotherapy related nausea, ondansetron is usually the answer. Be careful though, because it could prolong QTC interval, which may lead to torsades. All right, let's head over to question four. A G0P0 24-year-old female presents to your clinic with complaints of irregular menses for the past three months. Prior to symptom onset, her menstrual periods occurred each month and lasted four to five days. She additionally endorses 10 pounds of weight gain, which is not improved with diet restriction and increased exercise. The patient works as an accountant for a large marketing firm and reports increased stress with her job recently. Past medical history is significant for generalized anxiety disorder for which she takes fluoxetine. Vital signs are within normal limits. On physical exam, there are patches of dark, hyperpigmented skin on the nape of the patient's neck and bilateral axilla. What is the expected lab findings in this patient? A. Increased FSH. B. Decreased LH to FSH ratio. C. Increased 17 estradiol. D. Increased LH to FSH ratio. Or E. Decreased testosterone. Pause me for a minute or two to organize your thoughts, come up with the clinical presentation, and select your answer choice. Then unpause me when you're ready to go over it. Hopefully you have identified that this is the classic presentation for polycystic ovarian syndrome. The typical presentation for PCOS is an overweight female who demonstrates signs of insulin resistance such as elevated glucose or acanthosis nigricans, which are those hyperpigmented patches on the skin usually around the axilla or neck, increased levels of testosterone, and irregular menses. 
One thing that step one loves to test you on is that PCOS has an increased LH to FSH ratio, or answer choice D. Researchers have been trying to determine what causes this, and presently it appears that the hyperinsulinemia that accompanies PCOS affects the hypothalamic pituitary axis in such a way as to shift the ratio to increase LH more than FSH. But with regards to the exam, all you need to know is that LH to FSH ratio will be increased in polycystic ovarian syndrome. All right, great job on that one. Let's go to question five. A 74-year-old female presents to your office for routine evaluation. The patient was recently diagnosed with polymyalgia rheumatica, for which she was recently started on long-term prednisone. The rest of her past medical history is unremarkable. Vital signs are temperature of 98.7 degrees Fahrenheit, blood pressure of 152 over 90, heart rate 87 per minute, respiratory rate 18 per minute, oxygen saturation of 98%, and BMI of 34. Physical exam is unremarkable. What is the most likely mechanism for this patient's elevated blood pressure? A. Upregulation of alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. B. Upregulation of beta-1 adrenergic receptors. C. Decreased vessel compliance. D. Increased effective circulating volume. Or E. Downregulation of alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. Once again, pause me for as long as you need to practice doing the method and try to get an answer before unpausing me. Okay, so let's just boil this question down to its essentials. It is essentially just asking for the reason this patient who is on prednisone for polymyalgia rheumatica has an elevated blood pressure. Hopefully everyone here remembers that corticosteroids, such as prednisone, can cause a transient leukocytosis due to demargination of neutrophils, an increase in serum glucose due to upregulation of gluconeogenesis, and an elevated blood pressure by A. Upregulation of alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. Unfortunately, these are just things you have to memorize about steroids, but once you do, it will give you a few points come test day. Okay, question six. A father and mother bring their 13-year-old son to your office due to concerns about their son's height. They state that the patient does not seem to be growing at a normal rate relative to his peers in school. Past medical history is significant for developmental delay and intellectual disability. Vital signs are within normal limits. On physical exam, the patient has a short stature with a round face. The fourth and fifth metacarpals appear shorter relative to the other digits. The rest of the physical exam is unremarkable. What is the next best test to order for this patient? A. Serum parathyroid hormone levels. B. Genetic testing for 15q11 chromosomal microdeletion. C. Serum-free T3 and T4. D. Echocardiography. Or E. MRI of the head without contrast. In my opinion, this is probably the most challenging question in this question set, so take an extra minute if you need to before unpausing me and listening to the explanation. Okay, so we have a teen boy who has short stature with developmental delay and a round face. He has shortened fourth and fifth metacarpals. From the developmental delay and short stature, there are a few conditions that we have to consider, such as the trisomies, right, Down syndrome, Edwards syndrome, and Patel syndrome, Turner syndrome, thyroid issues, and metabolic conditions, and Albright hereditary osteodystrophy, which is also known as pseudohypoparathyroidism type 1a. So what helps us zone in on one answer is that line about the fourth and fifth metacarpals. Do you recall for which condition this is a relatively specific finding? If you were able to get it, then you deserve a pat on the back. This is a relatively specific finding for pseudohypoparathyroidism type 1a, also known as Albright hereditary osteodystrophy. If you were not able to think of that differential, you should try to list out all the conditions that cause short stature and identify one or two unique features that can help you identify each one. For the trisomies, we would expect a multitude of other physical findings, such as craniofacial abnormalities, rocker bottom feet, overlapping hands, etc. For Turner syndrome, it is true that they're often short, but we also expect patients to be female with a web neck and lymphedema in the extremities. For thyroid issues and other metabolic causes, they typically begin at a much younger age, which decreases the likelihood that it would be the correct answer, though it still could be possible. What makes the differential wrong in that case is the relatively specific finding for the shortened fourth and fifth metacarpals. Okay, so we all agree now that it's most likely Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy. Great. Now what test would you like to do? 
If you're unsure, think about the pathophysiology. So another name for Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy is pseudo-hypoparathyroidism type 1a. When you have PTH working normally, right, parathyroid hormone, the kidney will reabsorb calcium and excrete phosphate. This will increase serum calcium levels, which will negatively feed back and keep PTH levels normal. In pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, the PTH receptor in the kidney does not work, so you will have calcium spilling out into the urine and phosphate being retained in the blood. What will happen to PTH as a result? It will increase, but since it does not work on the kidney, you will still have decreased calcium and high phosphate levels. So in other words, the serum studies will look like you have low parathyroid hormone effects, but you will still see an elevated PTH level. So we want to do choice A, check the serum parathyroid hormone levels. All the other choices are associated with other conditions. Choice B is associated with a specific disorder called 15Q11 microdeletion syndrome, which essentially presents with many neurocognitive developmental issues. Serum T3, T4 would be checked if we had a higher suspicion for a thyroid condition. Echocardiography can be done if you suspect a genetic condition that structurally affects the heart, much like how Turner syndrome presents with coarctation of the aorta or bicuspid aortic valve. An MRI of the head without contrast would be to look for masses, hydrocephalus, ischemic damage, etc. Let's try our final question. A 54-year-old male presents to your office after he was found to have an elevated blood pressure at a health fair. He complains of fatigue and weight gain over the past six months. Past medical history includes hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes mellitus. Medications include losartan, hydrochlorothiazide, metformin, and atorvastatin. The patient consumes one to two beers per night, but denies current tobacco or illicit drug use. Vital signs include blood pressure of 176 over 80, heart rate of 76 per minute, respiratory rate of 17 per minute, oxygen saturation of 98%, and body mass index of 31. On physical exam, the patient has a rounded face and neck. Abdominal exam is remarkable for truncal obesity with purple striae noted over the skin of the abdomen. There is dark hyperpigmentation most prominent over the patient's palms. What is the most likely mechanism for this patient's elevated blood pressure? A. Atrophy of the adrenal cortex and medulla. B. Hyperplasia of the zona glomerulosa. C. Hyperplasia of the zona glomerulosa and zona fasciculata. D. Hyperplasia of the zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis. Or E. Hyperplasia of the zona fasciculata and zona reticularis. So take a minute, pause me, try the method one more time, and then we will talk about it. So, hopefully you were able to confidently arrive at an answer. Let's just cover the clinical presentation of this patient. We have a middle-aged male with hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, on medications, who presents with weight gain and fatigue. He has a rounded face, truncal obesity, purple striae, and dark hyperpigmentation patches over his palms. You should immediately identify this as a classic presentation for a Cushingoid patient. Since this patient has hyperpigmentation, you can make the assumption that this is more likely an ACTH-dependent hypercortisolism. Once you know this, the logic is pretty easy from here. Excess ACTH causes hyperplasia of the regions that correspond to increased production for cortisol and sex hormones, namely the zona fasciculata and the zona reticularis. The zona glomerulosa is what produces aldosterone and is largely unaffected by changes in ACTH levels so it wouldn't be hyperplased. Remember, aldosterone production requires only a little bit of ACTH present in order to function, but its serum levels are driven by the renin-angiotensin system. So naturally, the answer will be E, hyperplasia of the zona fasciculata and zona reticularis. All right, that's it for today, everyone. If you want more practice, feel free to check out our other videos. We have hundreds of free questions covering Step 1 and Step 2 CK content. I hope you had as good of a time as I did. I'll see you in the next video.